But if we can rest and rely on what God has done for us, then we know God does things perfectly. And so that's why we want to keep the good news good news. Say the bad news is, if salvation is up to you, you're lost. The good news is, God has done it for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, so the final slide here is the bottom line. It, one more. Thanks. Uh, so the bottom line is this, and again, this is what most Christians can, can affirm, uh, to say that humanity was lost and in great need. God responded to this need by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And we are saved and have eternal life because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. Now, in response, we should live our lives for Him. So as Lutherans, we do want to make sure to tell people, you know, follow the law, follow the commandments, do what God says. But you can't do any of that in order to earn salvation. It's only going to be a response to what Jesus has done for you. Since God has done this for you, now we live our lives for Him. Uh, so, now the final, final slide. Just hit it one more time. Questions and discussions. We have probably uh, five or ten minutes uh, if anybody wants to bring up really difficult questions. Yes? How come um, some people do communion every Sunday and some people do it like once a month? Oh, yeah, yeah. So how, how often uh, do different churches take communion? Uh, so I believe that historically it was always uh, every Sunday. Uh, and it was like that for many, many centuries, I think. Uh, and even uh, in the Lutheran Reformation, uh, Martin Luther still encouraged uh, communion on a regular basis, uh, uh, every Sunday. Uh, so it was more, as you get into the 1600s and 1700s, people started thinking, well, if you do it every week, then you won't really appreciate it. So if we do it less often, then you'll appreciate it more when we actually do it. And so in, in some uh, churches and including Lutheran churches, it was as as seldom as four times a year, maybe. Um, and, and then there's other Protestant denominations where I think maybe they do it once a year, and they think that's good enough. Jesus said, "Do this in remembrance of me," but he didn't say how often to do it. But the, the example of the early church seems to be often, uh, and uh, and so the so Lutheran church made it back to um, at least once a quarter, not just once a year. And then it was uh, once a month, uh, within the past hundred years or so, we got it to once a month. And then typically in the 20th century, it was twice a month, is what you would see at most Lutheran churches. And there is a movement afoot to restore that to every week. Uh, so there's, there are Lutheran churches that will have communion every single week. Uh, we actually have communion here at Our Savior every single week, just not at every single service. So if you did want to have communion every week, then you could find the service where Holy Communion is being offered. That's a good question. Uh, so, uh, the Roman Catholics, uh, you probably know, will have it every week. Uh, Doug? There's some distinct differences within the Lutheran Church, too, right? Especially like what you see in LA. Sure. Uh, yeah, so when we have, uh, within the Lutheran Church, then there's uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that's us, and we're about two and a half million out of that total of about eight. And then there's ELCA, which is Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. They're about 5 million out of that total. And uh, the, the difference between uh, these two church bodies really comes down to that, it's that question of authority again. Uh, when we go back to say, what is your source of authority? Roman Catholics say, well, we have a pope, and we have bishops, and we have theologians who can tell you what the Bible means uh, so that you're not left guessing. And you're not left contradicting each other like they see the process of doing. Uh, so, so Lutherans have always had this uh, the, the heritage, the tradition of following Scripture alone. But then in ELCA, uh, they've sort of gone the, the modern uh, scholarship method, what is sometimes called historical criticism, which means let's look at, at the Bible like it's an ordinary book and figure out where it came from, uh, what its origins are, and have ended up really removing the, the divine element to Holy Scripture, uh, to say that, uh, whereas we can confidently say the Bible is the Word of God, in the ELCA they would be more likely to say the Bible contains the Word of God. And when I first heard that, I didn't catch the, the difference. I thought, well, that sounds right, the Bible contains the Word of God, that's what I believe, except what they mean is that if 
you want to find the Word of God, you would go to the Bible, and it's contained in there, but it's also, uh, the Bible also contains uh, human opinion, perhaps outright errors, uh, certainly myths and stories that aren't supposed to be interpreted, are not supposed to be taken literally. And so, unfortunately, I think what that has uh, resulted in is sort of a pick-and-choose approach to theology. So that, uh, that their theology, and it, it tends to manifest itself primarily in social issues. So, whereas we might take a social issue and say, well, the Bible says this about that. And, you know, say they would be more likely to say, well, that was at that time and in that culture, uh, that's the way the Apostle Paul thought, but that's, that's not authoritative for us today. So what is the source of authority? Is the Bible in its entirety a source of authority for us today? Uh, we're always going to say the Bible applies to us now. It might apply differently. Uh, you might have, uh, it, you know, we, we have all sorts of situations today that just didn't exist even 10 years ago, right? Um, as technology increases and, and that sort of thing, our world is a very different place than it was 2,000 years ago. But we're still going to take the Word of God as the Bible and apply that to our current situation. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, whereas in the ELCA, they would be more likely to say, well, that's not relevant at all. The, the Bible says that, but we're not even going to consider that because uh, that's an outdated notion. Uh, and so th that's really, that's, that's where the difference comes, and then it, it manifests itself in, in, in different ways, mostly social issues and positions that they would take. Uh, other questions? Do we have a person, not like a poll, but is there a person of like Missouri Synod? In the Missouri Synod, uh, our organization uh, is really very congregational in its, uh, in its polity, meaning that each congregation is pretty much independent. Uh, that, that's something that we share uh, with the Baptists, uh, actually. Uh, they're very independent that way. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church is hierarchical, meaning there's a pope, and then there's archbishops, and there's bishops, and then there's uh, uh, the, you know, this whole structure of the, these levels. Uh, and actually, ELCA, because of their European heritage, they follow the model of the bishops. Uh, in Missouri Synod, we are congregational, and then we have formed an alliance, really, of congregations. Uh, and that's what we mean by the word synod. So the word synod is this organization of congregations, and we elect uh, officers who are going to help us work together, uh, uh, essentially to do things together that would be difficult or impossible to do alone. Uh, when we first started, we, we saw we, we want to be able to train pastors, have a seminary, and we want to be able to send missionaries to the foreign mission field. And those things are difficult for an individual church to do, but if pool our resources, we can do that together. And so we do elect a synod president uh, every three years at our national convention. Uh, I was our delegate uh, for our area of New York um, this past summer at the convention in Houston, and we elected Matthew Harrison as the new president. He replaced President Gerald Kieschnick. Uh, so, so there is... Uh, uh, synod president, and then we have district presidents as well. There's 35 geographical districts. Uh, Eastern New York is the Atlantic district, and so we have a district president uh, who's uh, David Banky, uh, Pastor David Banky. Uh, but uh, the role of these presidents tends to be more advisory, uh, more than authoritative. They, they can't say, you must do this, uh, or uh, move me from here to another parish then uh, that's more like the hierarchical system, and that's not what we have in, in the Lutheran Church in Missouri City. Other? Emma? Are we closer to the Roman Catholic or the other Protestant? Uh, I don't know. What, uh, what do you guys think? Uh, that's a good question. So are, you're saying are we closer to Roman Catholic or are we closer to Protestant? Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Should we put it to a vote? We're, we're, we're in the middle. And, and actually, I'm glad you asked that. And, and, you know, this is my daughter, but she's not a plant. <laughs> but uh, but this, this really is a good question. I'm glad she asked it because um, there are some Lutherans who will use the term evangelical Catholic to describe themselves. They say, uh, and to take those two words, evangelical means based on the gospel. Remember I said that, that for us we want to distinguish law and gospel and we want to preserve the gospel to be good news. So that's the word evangelical. The word Catholic means 
uh, when you break down that word into its root meanings, it means according to the whole. And so it's a word that the Roman Church appropriated for themselves. They are the Roman Catholic Church. But, it, but and actually, I'm not sure that uh, I think they they would just say we are the Catholic Church. We are the one church, and everybody else is broken away from us. Um, but we're going to take it in the classical sense, which also the Eastern Orthodox would say. Uh, in the Eastern churches, they came up with the, with the word Orthodox just because it seemed like the Roman Church had appropriated the word Catholic. But in the creeds, when we say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that original word is Catholic, meaning according to the whole, the, the universal of what all Christians believe. And that takes us back to our opening slides, remember? Uh, th th this is what all Christians believe. This is what we universally believe. And so uh, this is actually in the history of the Lutheran Church, too, when the Augsburg Confession was presented in 1530. Uh, the, the first uh, 20, I should know that, I think it's 22 articles out of 28. might be 21. No, it's probably 22. Um, uh, those are all, all articles to say this is how we are still in the Catholic Church. Uh, and we're not like these other splinter groups. For example, there's an article on Holy Baptism that says we baptize infants. Just like the Catholic Church has always done. We're not like those other groups that don't baptize infants. And uh, so, so the first 22 articles were intended to show this is how we are really not starting anything new. We're not breaking away. Uh, we're just trying to uh, uh, correct these abuses or reform these areas where things have gone astray. And there were only six or seven of, of those that were listed. Uh, so evangelical Catholic would be a way to describe this. We, we want to be as much as, as possible in the, the, the one church body of Christ, believing what all Christians believe, but we, we need to make sure that we're focusing on, on the gospel. So we're evangelical. Uh, the gospel is good news to say we can't do it. That's why God had to do it for us. Uh, I think that's probably a pretty good note to end on. Uh, speaking of notes, we're going to have music. Uh, so I, I invite the, the band up for our uh, closing song. Uh, as they're getting set, uh, let's close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had together. We pray that you would help us to understand uh, our Christian brothers and sisters, to see them as brothers and sisters in Christ, following the same Lord, having the same Savior. We pray that you would help us always to, uh, to know the truth of the gospel, that is what Christ has done for us, not what we could ever do for ourselves, that has won us salvation. We pray that you would help us then live a life in response to that, that we would follow your commandments in gratitude for all you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.